One of my favorite dates that uh, I like to do with my wife, I don't know if it's her favorite date, but it's one of my favorites, uh, is to go to the symphony. We've only been able to do it once since we came to Medfield because of COVID, but it was glorious. I actually, you may not know this, I actually grew up as a uh, classical double bass player. And so for me, it's a lot of fun to go to the symphony uh, and see these professionals do uh, a much better job of what I used to try to do. Uh, but what, one of the things that I learned when I was a bass player is that in the entirety of Western music history, nobody has ever wanted to listen to bass players play bass. <laughs> uh, it's, you know, it's just not a solo instrument. It's kind of like watching an NFL defensive lineman do ballet. There's just no chance that it's going to be graceful. And so if you, uh, as a bass player, want to, to make a living for yourself, you have to get into an orchestra, like the BSO, where you are needed. Because an orchestra is made up of you know, 30 to 70 people, depending on the work. Uh, and it's made up of 30 to 70 individuals. And every individual in an orchestra has two primary responsibilities. They have their individual responsibility, and they have a corporate responsibility to one another. Their individual responsibility is to go home, uh, it's to practice their craft, it's to learn their music, and make sure that they are prepared for the time when they come to rehearsal. And that's what they do on their own time. Uh, But when a symphony musician shows up to the orchestra, they also have a corporate responsibility to all the other musicians that are present. They need to be able to listen to those musicians, make sure that they're playing the same notes as those musicians, at the same speed as those musicians, at the same volume uh, as those musicians. And they have to be able to carefully watch and follow the conductor so that the entire orchestra is playing in sync and producing something incredibly valuable and beautiful. But you, can't, you have to have both. You can't neglect one for the other. Uh, if you only focus on the individual responsibilities, then uh, you will be super well prepared and you will be able to play your music really well, uh, but nobody wants to listen to you because you're a bass player, <laughs> and then you show up to your rehearsal But the fact of the matter is you don't know how to play well with others. And so you are actually a a harm to the overall music of the ensemble because you only know how to play by yourself and not as an ensemble. And then you get fired because of that. (laughs) Uh, On the other hand, if you only focus on playing with others, then you still show up to the rehearsal and and you're typically trying to play well with these other people, but the fact of the matter is you're not prepared and you don't know your part And so you also end up harming the final product uh, of the music. And the consequence, of course, is that you also get fired. (laughs) So we have to have both of these things, both the individual responsibility as a musician and the corporate responsibility as a musician. Well, when we think about our life together as a church, uh, we see both of these things held together in tension by the Apostle Paul and ultimately by God Himself. We as Christians have both individual responsibilities, like we are individually responsible to trust in Jesus Christ and be justified by faith. Uh, We are individually responsible, Jesus says, to go when no one else is looking and pray to God our Father. And strictly speaking, the American church is pretty good at the individual aspects of what it means to be a Christian. If I may say so, I don't think the American church is really great at what it means to be in the corporate responsibilities, what our corporate responsibilities are as Christians. And the fact of the matter is that we have both. Uh, We are called to live individually as Christians, and we are called to live together as Christians. And so when we examine our passage this morning, we're going to see both of these elements in interplay together. You'll see both individual responsibilities and corporate responsibilities. And we'll see that by the Spirit's power, we Christians are called to bear one another's burdens and to also keep watch on ourselves. So let's read our passage 
and we'll pray and jump in. Uh, Chapter 5, verse 25. He's building off of last week. He says, If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. But keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone, and not in his neighbor. For each will have to bear his own load. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you've chosen to reveal yourself to us through your word. God, I pray even now that you would grant us your spirit to hear your word and to rejoice over it. Lord, would you help me to preach this as you would have it preached? We thank you for this time together and simply ask that you would be among us as we study your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Paul begins and he says, if we live by the Spirit. Uh, You remember last week in verse 16, he said, I say walk by the Spirit and you won't gratify the desires of the flesh. And we saw how if we've been justified by faith, we've received the Spirit and God produces fruits of the Spirit in our lives as Christians. Nevertheless, he's saying here that if we walk, sorry, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step. With the Spirit. What does he mean by that? Uh, Well, what we see here is just as there's individual and corporate responsibilities, there are active and passive elements to our lives as Christians. Well, I hear an echo of myself. That's fun. (laughs) So he says, keep in step with the Spirit. Uh, That term there, it's a it's a military term. And, And and what it would be used for is is falling into line. So he's saying if you're being led by the Spirit, then you need to fall into line. You need to conform to what the Spirit is calling you to do. So there's a passive element of this in that we know that the Spirit will produce fruits of the Spirit in our lives, and yet we're still called to walk by the Spirit, uh, and we're called to keep in step with the Spirit. So we see these two things together. And in verses 26 and then the first verse of the next chapter, we're going to begin to see some examples of how we corporately as Christians can keep in step with the Spirit. So let's look at that. Now the first thing Paul says is this in verse 26, let us, that's important there, let us not become conceited, provoking one another and envying one another. This is really important. He says, let's not become prideful. Let's not become arrogant. Why? Because he's about, to, he's about to talk about restoring somebody who has fallen into sin. And so the first thing that is absolutely vital when we're talking about this is that we're not becoming conceited because what does arrogance do to the body? Well, arrogance among the body of Christ does to the body what not brushing your teeth after trick-or-treating does to your teeth. Uh, It just rots the body from the inside. He's saying uh, if we are conceited, then we're going to be provoking one another. We're going to be envying one another. We'll see somebody that has a position, perhaps, in the body that we would want. We'll think they don't deserve that, and and we should be there. Uh, Perhaps we will be jealous and we'll provoke one another, and will stir up conflict. It's not a healthy position to be in. And so we see that a spirit of humility, and Paul's going to come back to this, but a spirit of humility is absolutely vital to healthy life together in the church. Why? Well, because we see in verse 6-1 what inevitably will happen in any church, no matter how healthy He says, brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. 
Have any of you guys seen the musical Hamilton? Anybody? Okay. I've only seen it on Disney+. Plus. I didn't see it before. Uh, but there's a scene in Hamilton where Alexander Hamilton, the namesake of the play, uh, he, it, com it becomes public knowledge that he has been unfaithful to his wife. And his political rivals, Thomas Jefferson uh, and James Madison, hear of this. And there is an entire song in Hamilton dedicated to them dancing around, uh, passing out flyers, detailing it, and singing over and over, never going to be president now. You, you guys know what I'm talking about? They're, they're literally dancing on his political grave. They, they see Hamilton fall into a very public transgression, a very public sin. Yes, Hamilton messed up big time. And yet their reaction to that was to celebrate because... It was the death of a political rival. They knew that he was never going to be able to oppose them again. And, and the reality is that as human beings, that's what we naturally want to do when we see somebody else mess up. Because we always want to judge ourselves based on how others are doing. We always want to look at somebody who we see to be morally inferior to ourselves so that we can feel better about ourselves. And that can happen within the church as well. But while that may be the natural fleshly instinct to celebrate when somebody else fails, uh, that's not what we're called to do in the church. Uh, a Pharisee cannot restore a broken sinner. So, uh, what do we see here? Well, the first thing we see is that uh, we shouldn't be surprised if it comes out that there is sin in the body. He says, brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression. Uh, we shouldn't be surprised to find that because we all, uh, Christians, are, are sinners. Uh, the power of sin has been broken in our lives with the Holy Spirit, but the presence of sin remains until we go to be with Christ. So uh, the question isn't if there will be sin, but when there will be sin, and how will we as a body respond to that sin? He says... Those of you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. What does he mean by that? Spiritual ones here simply just means Christians. Those of you who have, we're not talking about different classes of Christians. Just those of you who have received the Holy Spirit should make it your aim to restore the person who is in sin. What does that mean? Well, it first and foremost means that you are exhorting and loving the person and calling them to repentance. Listen, uh, Christians are sinners. But the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian is that when a Christian sins, even a grave sin, they're going to repent, they're going to turn to follow Christ again, and if possible, they will make it right. And so he says, those of you who are spiritual should go to this person, not in a conceited attitude, uh, it's always really easy for us to come, yeah, uh, you shouldn't have done that and, and, and act very self-righteously, but, but, but that's not how you bring about a culture of grace. That's why Paul comes and he says this, you should restore him in a spirit of gentleness or a spirit of humility. Self-righteousness will never help the situation. Uh, being a Pharisee will never help the situation. Uh, adding more shame to the area will never help the situation. But rather, we're to recognize that as sinners, we are more than capable of committing whatever that person has done ourselves. And we recognize that as sinners, we've also already received grace from Jesus Christ. And so we are in no position to be judgmental, but rather out of love for this person, we're to call them to return to their first love, to return to Christ. I've heard one person describe it as one blind beggar telling another blind beggar where to find bread. And that's why Paul says, but keep watch on yourself. We've moved from the corporate 
to the individual. As a body, we should address this and we should try to restore the person, and yet we want to keep watch on ourselves lest we also fall into the same temptation. And that's where this spirit of humility is so important. Public sin is an opportunity not for pride and not for judgmentalism, but public sin is an opportunity for self-reflection and growth and healing for the entire body. It's an opportunity for the grace of God to flourish among us. So we see that as as Christians we are called uh, to restore the person who's in sin so long as they repent. In verses 2 to 5, we're going to see another responsibility we have as Christians to one another. And this also has individual and corporate elements. So I'll just read it. Verse 2, he says, Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Uh, At the heart of this section is this assumption. That every one of you and myself, that we all have burdens. Now, we may all have different burdens, but the reality is that we all have burdens. And as Christians, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we are called to bear the burdens of one another. These burdens could be financial. Uh, They could be uh, spiritual burdens. Maybe they could be burdens of loneliness or of depression or of sickness. Maybe they're persecution. Uh, Regardless of whatever manifestation the burden takes on, we as Christians are called not to pretend like we don't have burdens on the one hand, but we're actually called to help one another by bearing the burdens of one another. Now, I know it can be fashionable in some Christian circles to simply act like everything is okay at all times, but the reality is that we are all broken people. We don't want to celebrate our brokenness on the one hand, Uh, But the reality is that we cannot receive help until we're recognizing that each and every single one of us has a burden and we have a responsibility to bear the burdens of others. And so we're called to help one another through this life. And what that means is that it might require self-sacrifice. It might mean a limit to your freedom or even to what you would like to do for the sake of of helping a brother or a sister in Christ. But what is the really cool thing that we see here? He says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Well, that's kind of cool. What is this law of Christ that he's talking about here? Uh, Well, it's really similar to what he says in chapter 5, verse 14. If you go back to that, when he's again calling us to serve one another, he says, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word. And what is that? You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But we can also look at John chapter 13, where we have, uh, we have Jesus actually give us explicitly what this command is. You can also find it reiterated by the Apostle John in 1 John 3.23. But we'll just look at this for the sake of time. He says, A new commandment I give to you, this is Jesus speaking, that you love one another just as I have loved you, so you are also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. All of the ethical commands of Christ, all of the law of Moses can be summed up in that command. Just as Christ has loved us, so we are called to love one another. I, I want to be clear here, this is not sort of a, a romantic, uh, ooey-gooey feeling of love that we have for one another. If, if you have feelings of love for one another, that's, that's wonderful, but anybody who's been married for at least a year knows that uh, that ooey-gooey feeling of love for one another is not sufficient to build a marriage upon, uh, because it can be gone by about month six. But, but rather, this is, this is a tangible love. This is a decision to love whether you feel like it or not. Uh, this is a love that gets its hands dirty in other people's 
lives. It's one thing to say that you love someone or that you love your brothers and sisters in Christ. It's another thing to show it by demonstrating that love through acts of service, through acts of bearing their burdens. You say, well, pastor, that's, that's wonderful. Uh, that's so exciting that we can fulfill the law of Christ and, and bear burdens. But, but, you know, David Axberg, he's just got so many burdens and he's just such a burden to be around in the first place. I don't, you know, a lot of times I just don't feel like it. And, and let me tell you, I understand. Uh, he, you know, it can be really tough being around David. Uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding, David. I'm just kidding. We love you. Uh, but the reality of the matter is sometimes, as Christians, we're not going to feel like helping and showing love to our brothers and sisters. Uh, the body of Christ is kind of like a family. And you don't choose your family, but you, you do love your family, whether you feel like it or not. And sometimes we don't feel like loving our brothers and sisters. But here's where what Jesus said is so important. He, what, what did he say? He said, as I have loved you, so you are to love one another. See, we only love one another because we have first received the love of Jesus Christ. And so Christ is not only our example of what love looks like in the way that he went around and cared for people and loved for people, but he's our motivation for loving one another. I wonder if you remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, we we, we did Mark around this time last year, uh, and in the garden, with his disciples, and Jesus, in his humanity, knows what he's about to go through, and he says, "Father, if there is any other way for us to rescue these people from their sins, take this cup away from me." He's referring to the cup of God's wrath, where God would pour out the wrath that we deserved on Christ. He's saying, God, if there's any other way to do this, please take it from me. But what did he follow that with? He said, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will, the KJV says. And so Jesus accepted his role. And out of love for you, he continued, and he was arrested. And he was tried before sinful men. He was found to be innocent and yet condemned to death. And so they took him, made him carry his own cross. And they nailed him to the cross. Where not only was he in excruciating physical pain, but where God the Father poured out the wrath that your sins and my sins earned upon Christ. And at any moment, Jesus says, I could have called on legions of angels and they would have rescued me. But he stayed and he bore the wrath for your sake and for mine because he loved you. Jesus was the ultimate burden bearer. And Jesus didn't have to. And frankly, Jesus didn't feel like it. But he did so because he loved you. And so that's what Jesus is saying. As I have loved you, you Christians are to love one another. And this is a love that is not dependent upon how you feel. If Jesus was willing to bear that kind of burden for us, what does a a few hours out of the week mean for bearing the burdens of our brothers and sisters as we all seek to live lives which honor and glorify Jesus Christ? Listen, if if we're only showing kindness for others when, when we feel like it, then that's... That's not Christian love. In any way, we do this by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the encouragement here. You don't have to depend on your own power to love others, but you can depend upon the Holy Spirit. Uh, Now, I do want to, to draw out one application of this love that we have for one another. I know that this has been a difficult year, that many of us have have had to stay away, uh, and we haven't been able to to really be together as a church. Uh, 
And so I, I really want to address the people who, who aren't here right now. I know for those of you who are, who are high risk, you, you're not comfortable being here, and, and I understand that, and, and that's okay. Um, some of you are, are not high risk, and you're not being here. And, and I just want to say that it is really, really difficult to bear one another's burdens over Facebook. Uh, you know, listen, a phone call is a wonderful way to keep in touch with people and to help the lonely, but it's no substitute for being together in the flesh. Uh, and, and even for those of you who are staying home for, for legitimate reasons, I, I just, I want to say just be careful because it's, uh, I, I get it, and, and it's okay that you're not here. Um, but we are building habits where we're not present with our brothers and sisters. And so as we come out of this pandemic, I, I just want to encourage you, it's going to be tough to break the habit, but I want to encourage you to get back with the body and get back together so we can bear with one another. Uh, love is something that takes place together in the flesh. So that was my soapbox. I'm moving it over there, and we're moving on. All right. So we're called to bear one another's burdens. Uh, and Paul, again, brings us back around to pride. He brings us back around to pride because pride is going to ruin our ability to love our brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's what he says in verse 3. He says, For if anyone thinks he's something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. That seems like a strange thing to bring there. He, he, he's simply saying, uh, we'll see it as we continue, but he's, he's just saying that pride ruins selfless love. Uh, because if you are enamored with yourself, you're the kind of person who's going to see someone struggling and you're not going to want to help that person. Uh, the prideful are the ones who kind of say, well, you made your bed, now sleep in it. Uh, but as those who have received the grace of Jesus Christ, we're called not to be judgmental in that way, but to bear along with our weaker brothers and sisters and bring them along with us. Verse 4. He says, instead, instead of being arrogant, he says, let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. So this is where the individual element helps our corporate element as a body of Christ, right? He's saying, uh, what he's saying here is he's saying, stop comparing yourselves to one another. Uh, again, we, we like comparing ourselves to one another because we see other people that we think aren't doing as well as us, and then we look in the mirror and we think we look really good. But the reality is he's saying, test yourself. Compare yourself to Jesus Christ. Go take a gander at the way Jesus lived. Go take a, a gander at the way Jesus loved people, and then go look in the mirror. And you're not going to be as impressed, and you're not going to be as prone to pride as you would be when you're looking at one another. Comparing ourselves to Christ ends our boasting and leaves it for the end of times. Where'd you get that, Pastor? Verse 5, Paul says this. this, is again where the individual element comes in. He says, for each person will have to bear his own load. What does that mean? Each person will have to bear his own load. Uh, did you know that as a Christian, you will one day have to appear before the judgment seat of Christ? Non-Christians will also have to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. But God has determined a day in the future where he will judge the world. You say, well, what about Romans 8.1? There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's absolutely accurate. There is no condemnation. You are justified by faith in Christ alone. Well, then why are we appearing before the judgment seat of Christ? Let's look at 2 Corinthians 5.10. We have a slide for this. He says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Uh, Christians, like non-Christians, will appear before the judgment seat of Christ not to determine our eternal fate, but to determine our reward for the way that we lived while in the body, for the way that we obeyed the law of Christ. Maybe you remember the, 
the parable of the talents where a man goes away and leaves his servants with different sums of money and expects them to do things with it. And when he comes back, they are rewarded according to how they used his funds. That's the idea that we're getting here. <laughs> and in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, we're not going to go to it now, but Paul says, on that day, each of us will receive our commendation from God. So he's saying, there's no room for boasting now, because on the last day, that's when God is going to judge all of us. And that's when the only person who actually is impartial and actually wise enough to judge everyone is going to judge us. And on that day, when he determines what we deserve, we will have cause for boasting. So, on that day, it will be perfectly clear from God's perspective who has cause for boasting. Because we won't be judged by our standard, by looking at one another, but we'll be judged by his standard. And it's going to be a glorious time. Uh, life in the church can be really, really ugly. I think many of us have, have experienced when life in the church goes awry. And it, it's ugly because it's comprised of humans. We're all sinners. We're all children of Adam. The good news is that Jesus came to save not the righteous, but sinners. But the church can also be the most beautiful, shining example of selfless love that you will ever experience this side of eternity. And what we experience as a church will in large degree be determined by individual and corporate elements. How well we understand ourselves to be sinners saved by God's grace alone and by our decision, by the power of the Spirit, and not in our own power, to love one another selflessly and sacrificially. If we understand why we stand, how we stand before God, as saints, as his beloved children, because of his grace alone, and that causes us to love one another, then this will be an incredible experience of selfless love. So let's pray to that end, that God will help us grow into that. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word.